future here. Once we get done with today, it will be um, provided in the links and in our recording folder. Um, folks, if you have issues, problems, questions, feel free to put them in the chat and um, and you can go ahead and see what's going on out there in the world. With that, I will kick it. I'll stop presenting here and kick it over to Kim. See if I can't let these folks all in. Go ahead, Kim. All righty, let's see here. I am, first of all, hey everybody. <laughs> Good to see you all again, or hear you all, or see your little icons or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is these days. Um, so let me, I'm going to get my, I'm going to jump right into things and get started. We got a lot to talk about and I want to leave tons of time for discussion and questions and all kinds of different things. So let me, first of all, slide this out of the way. And Jen's got me all schooled up on sharing here. All right, so I'm going to do that and then let's see if we get this right. Jen present okay now i gotta do the little thing you just taught me how to yep. swap okay i think i got it bueno right yeah, on. Bye, bye, okay bye, yeah sweet okay thanks everyone um oh let's see right, is my camera still on by any chance i can't see it but that's a limited screen space maybe if, uh, if someone else okay i'm gonna face, let her know i can you see are, i'm yeah. gonna okay i'm gonna turn it off just because it um my internet sometimes gets a little wonky here so um i'm gonna i'll kill that i'll come back and say hi to everybody afterwards when we do some discussion um okay so we've we've presented a bunch of stuff on nifty this i think throughout this year actually which has been really cool and with the national prescribed fire review and and just interest in getting all this fuels work done you know we're getting a lot of requests about using nifty this for specific things we've taught i think the last time we talked it was we kind of did a higher level overview on using if disk for your burn plan and and sort of the contingency holding idea. Um, and there were some requests to do a little more in depth on the editing of landscapes, what I call getting your landscape right. Um, so then you can proceed to do all your fire behavior and things like that. Um, so I broke this presentation into two parts. The first is going to be on on that editing piece. And it should lead very nicely into the second part, which is the contingency and holding and using those tools to kind of figure out resource needs and stuff. Um, so that they'll kind of flow together, I hope. And then there should be plenty of time to, to do some demo and talk and do some question answer and stuff. Um, Bree Schuler um, is with us, as is Josh Hyde. And um, they're going to kind of monitor the chat and chime in if I get something wrong and kind of make sure I stay on track. Um, but definitely throw stuff into the chat box. And if we need to pause and talk about anything, we can certainly do that too. I ran a whole bunch of stuff at IFTI Disc last night, and um, the map was being a little laggy. So I threw a bunch of stuff into PowerPoint slides. So I thought we'd just go through the slides first. Then if there's some things we want to look at in IFTI Disc Live, um, we can pull the application up and go back into the into into the to the live demo mode and and use it that way. So I thought just for getting through some of the content and and being able to talk, it would be easier. So anyway, so that's where we're at right now. So um, I'm Kim Ernstrom and I work for the Wildland Fire Management RDNA and have been working on this IFTI disk stuff for. Um, a long time now and uh, we've made a lot of great progress and we've got some new stuff um, that I'll go over too as I'm walking through some of the slides today. We've made some improvements in the map interface and, and stuff. I don't think we've talked too much about that. We've also increased our um, landscape size from we had what was three and a half million acres. We are now able to do up to 12 million acres. Is that right Bree? Or Josh, did I get that right? I think it's 12 million. Um, that is. Yeah. So, which is really cool because now you could do an entire forest, you know, landscape if you wanted to. You know, there's reasons to do that and there's some reasons not to do that. But anyway, the cool thing is we've been able to scale things up. So um, that's that's new as of as of the last few months. And then we have the new land fire data in there. The 2020 is available and I'm going to show you some of that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just go ahead and jump right in and get started. And uh, I can't see the chat, so um, 
Bree or Ja, Bree, if you see anything, or Jen, let me know and I can stop. So, well, Dale. All right, cool. All right, so the first thing though that I have to talk about is um, Caroline. <laughs> Just really quick, I got to do a shout out. Caroline Noble, who's been with the RDNA since 2014, retired on Monday, and uh, so she's she she's we she's been part of the IFTI disc team since we started IFTI disc back in well since the RDNA started IFTI disc back in uh, about well when she joined 2014, and then our first release was 2017. So she's been a just a super important part of the progress we've made, and and we can't thank Caroline enough for all her awesome work. So anyway, Caroline's gonna come back sort of on a part-time basis to help with things. So you, she will reappear. Um, she's gonna help with some training and some other stuff as we go forward. And But she's gonna take a little, a little time to chill out and enjoy her retirement before we put her back to work. So anyway, I just wanted to do that because she's been such a big part of all this. And I know a lot of you folks know her. So anyway, great job with Caroline. All right. So editing landscapes. So let's talk editing landscapes. Um, the most recent land fire data was updated in 2020, and that's what we have in IFTDIS right now. So it's 2022, we're going into 2023, and things can happen, right, over, over those years that change the, the landscape versus what we have in the data. So that's why it's important to always review and edit your landscape before you do anything. Um, we also have mapping errors, you know, it's, it's a lot of the land fire data is acquired through uh, Landsat imagery and uh, through machine learning and stuff. So it's not always perfect, but it's it's the best data set that's out there. It's wall to wall coverage and there isn't really anything else like it outside of the US. So we're pretty lucky to have it. So anyway, I want to talk about how we can um, edit it and use it. Um, so we can just once we make our edits, then we can move forward and uh, and do our fire behavior and things like that. The, I want to point out the online user support center because there's a ton of information in there. All the things I'm going to talk about today are pretty much documented in our online help system. So this is the help center and you can see we've got um, under the using landscape section, there's all of these different topics. So if you're not sure, this is the first place to go look. Um, and there's some tutorials in here and all the edit rules and things that I'm going to talk about. You can find some step by step instructions in the user support center. So um, definitely check that out if you start playing with this and wanting to to learn more. Or you're not sure if you're doing something right. It's the first place to go. OK, so what I'm going to do is go through an example. This is from a project that is on the Sawtooth National Forest, so south of Twin Falls. Um, you can see we're up here in Boise, and then we go down to Twin Falls, and this landscape is south of there. Um, it's part of this Albion Raft River uh, restoration project, and Stacy Tyler, who's the uh, fire planner on the Sawtooth, uh, helped me with this um, example. So what I've done, I, and it says adapted from, so keep in mind, I've taken a little license with their project, and um, and use it more as an example so I could demonstrate some things. So just keep that in. This is a real project, but I have kind of modified some of the things um, that they're actually doing. So anyway, but it's a it's a good one and I really appreciate their help in letting me borrow this for an example. So I threw some stuff into Google Earth just to get everybody oriented on what the landscape looks like. So we are looking north. This is the burn unit. Um, and it's planned. They haven't done it yet. It's they're doing some prep and some. I think they're finishing up their their burn plan in NEPA still. Um, but you can see that it's not a lot of urban interface around here. There is outside of the mountain range. There's a lot of ag and there are some structures and stuff. But in the immediate vicinity, it's it's um, it's it's really just up in the mixed con and and some of the again the aspen. What they're trying to do is regen um, some aspen and get some some habit elk habitat and stuff uh, restored. So this is looking north. This is flipped around and now we're looking south actually. So you can get a little better idea of the lay of the land and the fuels that are in there. So from that, we're gonna jump over to IFTDIS and the landscape part of this and the, the editing piece, I think I, I laid it out this way because I, I, this is I think pretty realistic. Um, 
so for this landscape, I went in and grabbed the landscape data from IFTDIS. This is the 2020 land fire data. And so you can see the uh, the burn unit here in the middle. And over to the right of that, there's this mechanical treatment 2012 called Middle Hill. And that's that polygon there. So that was a treatment that was done in 2012. And I pulled that polygon out because, because that was 10 years ago. And um, the land fire data did reflect the uh, treatment very pretty well, but I, I wanna make some adjustments to it. So I'm gonna use that as an example for one of the edits that we're gonna make over here on this middle hill treatment area. Then the second adjustment we're gonna make is this mechanical yarding. And they, they've been working on this along the way. These are some roads and some trails that go through the burn unit and kind of around the burn unit area. And they're basically going in there with chainsaws and, and lemming and, and doing some, you know, some thinning, widening the road system, et cetera, removing that material to, uh, you know, to have a place for, um, you know, if it's going to be a place where they cut the prescribed fire off, or maybe they break this into two pieces, um, access for equipment, et cetera. So, so there's been some mechanical treatment done along these, these real linear um, pieces. So in order to make that, and that was just done in last year, so that would not be reflected in the land fire data because the last time the data was, was updated was in 2020. So that's the things you always have to keep in mind. When was the treatment done and when was the, the data actually, you know, acquired and, and available? Anything after 2020 wouldn't be reflected. Anything before 2020 should be, but it might not always be perfect. So that's why you want to go in and check. So the other piece that's in here is a wildfire from 2016, this grape fire that's down here. And in this case, the, the 2020 land fire data did pick up that wildfire and, and mapped the fuels fairly well. So I'm not going to make any edits to that wildfire polygon but I do wanna make some changes to these other two mechanical treatments. So that's where we're gonna start with this. Okay, so, so the idea is pulling this into IFTDIS and then working through the editing rules uh, to make things reflect, you know, kind of the real world out there. So in this case, this is that middle hill um, treatment unit from 2012, and uh, it was mapped as a, G a GS2, a 122. So it's like a grass shrub model. and Again, this is more for example purposes, but in my mind, when I went out, say we went out there and walked around this area and you said, you know what, that mechanical treatment, it's really, it's really more of like a shrub model. Maybe over the past 10 years, more shrubs have grown up. It has less of a grass component and we really feel like it's going to burn more like a shrub than a grassy area. So if you think about it fire behavior wise, what does that mean? Well, a grass model is going to have faster rates of strip faster rates of spread than the shrub model. So if this is our burn unit over here, this is the blue line here on the left. Um, it's important to me to get this polygon correct because it, especially if I had an escape, if this is gonna have a slower rate of spread than what the, what the land fire is reflecting, I wanna make sure that's captured when I run my fire behavior because that's gonna impact, you know, if I had a contingency plan or, or a holding situation where I needed, I might be able to use this fuels treatment actually to help me. So I wanna get it right. So we're gonna make a change there. We're gonna change that. We're gonna edit that land fire data from a grass shrub two to a shrub two. So basically what I do is I look at the 40 fuel model guide and I start to think about not so much the pictures. I know we all, you know, I get a little hung up on the pictures myself, but what I really want to look at is this fire behavior down here. So in the grass model, like I said, so what if you go to the 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 the, the rate of spread, the, the graph on the left, and you look at 10 miles an hour wind speed, and you come over, I'm going to go to the red line here. Um, you can see what our rate of spread would be at 10 miles an hour for wind, about six, oh, let's just call it 60 um, chains an hour. Okay, if I were to change that, that's the grass shrub rate of spread. If I change that to a shrub two, then under a 10 mile an hour wind, my rate of spread is now 20 chains per hour. And so say I was out there walking around saying, you know, that makes a lot more sense to me. I really don't think it's going to spread that fast. So I want to fix it. So I get those lower spread rates when I run my fire behavior. 
And in this case, the, the uh, flame length, which is the other graph, isn't really going to change that much. These two fuel models happen to have similar flame lengths, but the rate of spread does change, so that's important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my, you know, into IFTDIS and make that change. So that's the first edit I'm going to make. The second edit I'm going to make is that that area where the yarding was occurring. So I showed you in that first picture where that road system was cutting through the burn unit. And then these other polygons to the north here are, um, are outside of the burn unit, but still could be important because they could be used for holding. Um, so the idea is they went in and are doing some work along these roads, you know, limbing, removing the material, um, you know, kind of taking that ladder fuel out of there and, uh, and you know, sort of making it so the rate of spread will be quite slow in, in there, which is what we'd want, especially for control. So these are the different fuel types that are, that you can see it's a mix. So uh, 165 is this dark green. Um, over here on the right is this grass model. That's the yellow. That's the 102. I'm not going to worry too much about that because it's a grass model. It doesn't have overstory to it, so I'm not worried about spotting and things like that. So I'm not going to mess around with the grass. But the other ones that I want to change are the 165 because that's a Connor, you know, that's an overstory model. Um, we have this grass shrub over here that's similar to the one I was just talking. That's the same as I was just talking about. And you could, you know, you could remove the shrub material so it's, it doesn't have that that vertical component to it. And then this other one, the 161, is another understory model. So that's that light green um, color. So those are the three I'm going to modify. So what I want to do is take these three fuel models, and because I did that mechanical treatment in here, I want to change them to what I put in this box where it says a, uh, to a TLA to 188. And what that's going to do is reduce the rate of spread and the flame length. If I do a mechanical treatment and my, my whole point is to reduce fire behavior, I need to reflect that again in the, um, in the land fire data. So when I run the fire behavior, it matches what I think will happen. And again, this was not reflected in the land fire data because these treatments occurred a year later after the data was acquired. So those are the, those are the changes. Again, I'm gonna, now I'm going to show you the 40 fuel models again. And this is kind of how I usually work through this stuff, trying to, you know, you got to decide what fuel model do I want to change it to. So this is the 165 at the top, the 161 in the middle, and then that 122 at the bottom. And same deal, if I have a 10 mile an hour wind speed for each of these, um, and I go up to the, to the, this is, I'm using the red line just because it's easier to illustrate a very low fuel moisture. You can see for the 165, I'm at a 20 chains per hour for spread spread uh, rate. Uh, for this one, I'm at about a 10, and say this one, I'm at about a 60. So by changing that to a 183, oh, I said 188. I meant to say 183. Sorry about that. I think my I gotta fix that slide. Um, now at a 10 mile an hour wind speed, my rate of spread is way slower. It's down to like six chains an hour. So by doing that mechanical treatment, I'm changing the fire behavior. So I got to show that on the map. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change all three of these in that in that those polygons to this 183. OK, so in order to do that in IFTDIS, we go into our landscape edit tool. Um, so under landscape evaluation, this is um, when you when you log in, you come to our cycle, which is our our cycle of different choices of things you can do. Um, under landscape evaluation, I have landscape edit. The other one I'm going to use is the model fire behavior. And once I make the edits, then I want to run the fire behavior and see what's different. So in landscape edit, I'm going to go to that. And this is what that screen looks like. So now I've got my landscape on the left. And you can see I've got the uh, middle hill polygon, which is the green here on the right. That's the one I'm going to change to a shrub model to reduce the spread rate. And then you can see the uh, kind of the linear polygons, which is that yarding treatment here that goes through the unit, where I'm going to train, change all three of those um, fuel models to that 183, again, to reduce that spread rate. So in order to do that, I, I work through the landscape edit uh, rules. And at the top, I select my landscape. And in this case, it's the Stinson Landfire 2020. And then I work through, the, I work through each of these rules. And then I end up with my rule set at the top. 
to make those changes. So I'm going to go to the next screen because it's going to show you in detail what those rules look like. So for the middle hill treatment on the left, you select uh, this is my fuel model and anywhere the fuel model equals a, a grass two at 122, I'm going to change that to an SH2, a 142. So that's, that's as simple as it is, making that rule change from one to another. And it says apply to landscape mask. You don't have to always do this, but I wanted to do it just for that polygon. I don't want the whole landscape to change. I want it just everything within that, that Aspen restoration polygon. So that's that middle hill polygon. So I select that polygon and that'll make that change just to that polygon. And I say add to rules. Then the second change is the one I want to do um, over here in uh, in the yarding treatment. So same thing, but now I've got I've got several I've got several um, places where I want to change all of the fuel models in those polygons. So what I, rather than going through each um, each fuel model, I want to change this to this and this to this. Rather, I'm just saying anywhere in that polygon, and I picked elevation in this case, anything where the elevation is above zero within that polygon, which is everything, I'm going to change it to a 183. That way I know everything in that polygon is going to change. So that's what I did there. And I said, add to my rules. And I did it just for that yarding polygon. So this is what the final rules look like down here at the bottom. I've got the middle hill uh, thinning unit. And then I've got the yarding polygon. So those are my rules. So I'm set. I did it. So I say, I say, save my save my new land fire data set. And this is what it looks like. So on the left, we have the landscape we started with. You can see the middle hill treatment here and the yarding in orange. That was our original. And then after I save and make those edits, you can see what I call it gets baked into the into the landscape. Um, so here we are. We've got the blue, which is the yarding treatment, changed all of that to that 183. And then you can see this orange shape over here, which is where I changed all that to a shrub model. So I think we're good. I think I'm pretty satisfied. My landscape is now reflecting what I think is out there on the ground and it reflects the mechanical treatments that we did. Okay, so let me stop. Has any questions come up? Anything we wanna review or go back over? Or... Yeah, question no, just no. came in, Kim. I'm just now reading it. Okay. Yeah, and I can keep going and then we can we can always come back to some of this stuff too. So and I'll, I did put a note in there just to touch on if you're wondering, you know, how do I get those landscape masks into the system? Um, those can be hand drawn on the map with the create edit shapes widget, or you can upload your own shape files that you have of treatments. And so when you when you select that first that landscape that you're going to edit, that drop down box for masks is going to adjust and so it's only going to show you shapes or shape files that fall within your landscape so it kind of filters the data for you hey, for masking hey yeah yeah Once thanks you for edit too. this you know let's say we do some edits here etc the question in the chat box is related to that underlying raster what happens to that is is your are your edits when you're in this uh, you know, personal landscape mode, it's not going to change that underlying raster data, is it? I think that's where we're going with that one. That's right. Yeah, no, that's a good, very good question. So when you make edits, you're just creating a new, a new version for you to use for this, for my, this project. So the, the original 2020 land fire data does not change. Um, it'll, it's always out there for use in its, in its intended mode <laughs> and then you take that and change it just for your specific uh for, for your specific use so i'm making a new landscape with these changes in it um so it, it won't affect anything down the road for anybody else this is just for your use for this particular instance right on Hope, let, laura let me know if that didn't answer your question but we'll let kim continue yeah that's a it's, and that's a great question um okay so now what I want to do is I want to look at the fire behavior 
on both of those landscapes to be like, OK, did that does those changes I made, does it make sense when it comes to fire behavior? Because the reason we're doing this right is to we want to look at fire behavior. That's the whole point. So I'm going to go back in and like I showed you uh, earlier, we have that choice to do landscape edits and we also have that choice to do run fire behavior. So I clicked on the model fire behavior and now we've got again, we have to pick our landscape. We always start with our landscape, but this time I picked the landscape that I just made. So it's the land fire 2020 data set, but I put yard and thin, meaning that included those two edits. So it's when you're working in nifty it's really important to name things um, so you can find them and you remember sort of what you did to them. So naming conventions, you'll learn as you're using it to be kind of careful about that because you, you can confuse yourself pretty quickly once you have a whole bunch of files and stuff in there. So naming things is important. So for running this basic landscape fire behavior, it's remember we talked, I think in the last presentation I did, whether if you weren't on that, part of what I was discussing was that um, running basic landscape fire behavior in IFTDS is the same, it's pretty much the same as behave. It's just spatial. So it's just we took each of those fuel models and we're and it's getting a fire behavior output for each pixel. It, we're still using Rothermel's fire spread equation, nothing's changed there. But now we're just able to display it on the map because we're doing it pixel by pixel. So the inputs are pretty much the same as you would use for um, for behave. You still need a wind speed, um, a wind direction. You have to decide on your crown fire uh, type. In this case, I'm not going to worry about in this example. I used Scott and Finney or uh, um, I used Finney in this case. But you could change that if you needed to. I don't want to get into the details of that for this discussion. Um, and you have to put in your fuel moistures. Those are the most important pieces of this. So in this case, I used what I'm calling my moderate prescri uh, prescription. And so I've got some fuel moistures, seven, eight, and nine in the, in, the, in the fine fuels, and then 100 and 120 for the live fuels. And again, depending because this landscape has live fuels in it, you'll have to include those live fuel numbers, fuel moisture numbers. So that's all I do for running my fire behavior is I pick my landscape, I enter my wind speeds, my fuel moistures. We do have a, a, an ability to do some fuel moisture conditioning, um, and that's kind of a topic unto itself. So if you guys want to learn more about that, there's this little question mark next to the fuel moisture conditioning section, and you can click on that and you can read all about how to do fuel moisture conditioning. And basically it's correcting for elevation and, um, and any changes in weather over time. So um, but like I said, for this purpose, for today's purpose, I don't want to talk about that. So I just chose not to condition the fuels. And then I give it a name. So in this case, I've got my run is now I'm going to do mod. I put mod for moderate. That's my moderate prescription. OK, so let's see what we get. Oh, this is the online user uh, help center again. Anything again, like I said earlier, and if you this under landscape fire behavior, there's a there's a whole section you can see on running landscape fire behavior. There's a tutorial in there. Uh, you can learn about the inputs and the outputs, um, running things with an area of interest, et cetera. So always again, if you're not sure about this and you're new to it, definitely go in and read the help because I think it'll walk you through the steps pretty, pretty simply. So this is what we get after we run fire behavior. So the, the image on the left is before I made any edits at all. I just took the 2020 data and ran it just like it just like it comes out of the package. And again, I used those moderate prescription parameters. Again, the same inputs you would put in to behave. Um, our fuel moistures, seven, eight, and nine, and then our live fuel moistures and our wind speed and our wind direction. And you can see what we get. So in IFTDIS, you can use this little identify tool, which is this little round eye tool at the top. And you can click around on the screen and then it'll show you um, all the outputs for that particular location. So I clicked on the yarding area and before doing any editing, I was getting about three chains an hour in rate of spread. And then the middle hill treatment, which is over here on the right, um, I was getting about six chains an hour. And that was before we changed the fuel models. So you can kind of see what it looks like under this is rate of spread. You could also look at flame length and the other outputs too. 
then if you remember, we made those changes. So I changed the grass and the timber to in timber understore story models in the yarding, and I changed that to this um, timber litter model TL3. And then for the middle hill unit, I changed the grass to a shrub. So with those changes, now I see the fire behavior on the right, and you can see there's there's quite a difference actually um, in the rate of spread. So this is after editing, and you can see the yarding now, the rate of spread has changed to about a half a chain an hour, which for you know implementing our prescribed burn is probably what we want. You know, if I want to use this this road system as sort of a control line, um, that probably did what I wanted it to do. So I could say, OK, I'm going to reduce my rates of spread now that I did that mechanical treatment. And then it did reduce the rate of spread a little bit over here in the middle hill from six chains an hour to four. So not a lot, but some. And I think maybe that reflects better about the field type that's out there. So making that landscape reflect what's actually on the ground and understanding what the fire behavior can do while you're implementing your project is, is what we're after here. The other thing to keep in mind about these is, is always, you know, looking outside of your burn unit. Pro this whole presentation today is, I'm not even going to talk about what's going on inside my burn unit, because as being, you know, putting my burn valves hat on and thinking about contingency and holding and stuff, I really care about what's happening outside of the burn unit. Um, so you can look at the fuel, fuel models and then the fire related fire behavior outside of the burn unit. We're going to talk about that in the second part here. So hopefully that makes sense. We got the before editing and the after editing as far as in this case, it's just rate of spread. But in IFTDIS, we can look at lots of outputs. So that's kind of how it works in IFTDIS. It's pretty simple because like, I'm going to go back up um, two slides here. Um, let's see. So again, these are the inputs. Uh, wind speed, wind direction, fuel moistures, and then I get to my outputs. Okay. So let me stop because I'm going to, the next part of this is going to go into talking about how we apply a lot of this to our holding and contingency stuff. So anything um, on editing? And we're at, let's see, where are we at time wise? We're at the bottom of the hour, right? You're doing fine. You only got, you're only half hour in. Okay. Because I, like I said, there should be time we can go and do this live in Ifty Dis if we want to revisit a few of these concepts um, in hey, the Kim, application. Kim, help me out with so. this one. So, yeah, we have a question about uploading um, various raster layers. I know we can't upload raster uh, yeah. yet, but can we can we do shape files still in Ifty Dis? Last time I was yeah, and Bree it. was. That's what Bree was talking about. We can definitely upload shape files. Um, the little widget on the screen here, the widget that shows um, it's this little orange with the upload the arrow that's pointing up. That's where you click to upload a shape file. So any polygon, a line, or a point, we can upload into IFTDIS. We 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 get tons of questions, and I'm hoping we can do this so sometime soon. And I know a lot of people have have landscapes that they've worked on um locally or maybe for their state or or whatever the you know unit might be and they want to use their land fire data because they've already made the edits and we totally mm -hmm. get that we can't do that right now but and i'm literally glad brie is on the phone with us and josh because um <laughs> we get that question almost every time we do a presentation so i'm hoping in time we'll have a way to upload a, like your own landscape to use for all right. this analysis. Yeah. So shape files, yes, raster layers, no. Correct. Shape files, yes, raster, no. Okay. For now. Uh, Christopher, you got a, your hand up. What do we got? Yeah, more of a more of a comment than a question. You did, you just, uh, one of your, the things you did just is going to save me a lot of time, but using that, using elevation rather than fuel models to change the multiple yep. fuel models um i a light bulb came on and i just that that was cool I, i'm gonna use that <laughs> yeah no that's great and, and then that's a great way to do it you could also use aspects because a lot of people sometimes are saying well my north aspects it's a lot you know it's a lot wetter versus south aspects so maybe i want to change all my north aspects and tone that down a little bit and change the fuel model in there um, so that's another good way to do it. But yeah, you might have an elevation change where your vegetation type changes. Maybe that's not being captured just exactly the way you want it to be. So yeah, anything above or below a certain elevation, 
Um, yeah, that's a great way to do it. Or you could even yeah. do between. Maybe there's like a belt, you know, or a band, or maybe you get a thermal belt or something that changes fire behavior. So you wanna you wanna change that. So yeah, any of those parameters are are great for that. Definitely. Yeah. No, thank you. It's gonna be a time saver. Thanks. Yeah, and an another way you could do it too is if you wanted, say you were you had an area that were you were concerned about torching or your crown fire or something. We also have the canopy base height, the canopy cover, the canopy bulk density uh, parameters in there as well. So first, like the torching situation, maybe you have a little area that you know is going to throw a lot of spots. You could lower your canopy base height there and then simulate, oh, this could be an area where we, we might get, you know, that extra crown fire torching going on. So, yeah, any of those parameters within the land fire data are really useful for making those adjustments. Yeah. That's great. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, should we move on to holding and contingency? Then, like I said, we can come back and do some more demo-ish stuff if we want to. All right. So the big, I know the big, I feel like the big question these days, at least that's been coming across my desk a lot, is using IFTDIS for resource needs. And I know that came out in the National Fire Review about doing a, you know, having a better measurement of that. And um, we have contain and behave plus, which is, you know, it, it's, it is, it's got some use to it. And I'm going to show you some comparisons here and hang with me on this because I'm going to say, honestly, I don't have this all figured out. And I would actually love to have some feedback from you guys on, on some ways to think about this. And Bree and Josh and I have been talking too about if there's in the future, we'd love to develop something in IFTDIS that could do this in a much better spatial way that would help people. So as I'm talking through this, keep that in mind. Like I said, none of this is like a done deal and I'm kind of still brainstorming in my own mind about the best way to use this. So, so let's work through this and then maybe we can have a little discussion kind of at the end. Um, so other part of IFTDIS is look is you know sort of understanding your landscape, like I talked about with the editing. Um, and in order to use some of the other tools, even like the contain uh, part of, of Behave Plus, uh, you kind of have to know what fuel models to put in there, right? You got to pick some fuel models. So um, obviously we do that spatially in IFTDIS, but in Behave you gotta you gotta list them out. So I just wanted to show you the reports really quickly in case you hadn't seen that before, because um, it's a good way to get an understanding of what's happening um, spatially. So there's two ways to do reports. You can do a report for your whole landscape, which is the whole square that you draw, or you can do a report, which is the bottom one here, just for an area of interest. So in this case, in the bottom one, I picked my burn unit boundary from this example. And the report's only going to give me the information within that burn unit boundary. The upper one would be a request for a report for the whole square. Um, so there's two ways to do it. This is what it looks like when you request those reports. I just grabbed two of the pieces of the report. There's a lot more to it, and I can show you one of the reports in IFTDIS. So the top one is, again, just within that burn unit boundary. And th in this case, I just wanted to get a breakdown of what the fuel models were. You could also do this for fire behavior. Once you ran your fire behavior, you could get a report and look at the breakdown of flame lengths and rates of spread and things like that. Um, but for this one, I just wanted to show you the fuel models. And I'm doing this mostly because I'm gonna show you Behave Plus next. And I wanna be able to um, decide what fuel model to put in there. So th for me, it was easiest to just get a breakdown and see what are my predominant fuel types. So within the burn unit, you can see we've got a lot of this um, timber understory, uh, both the TU1 and the TU5, and then this grass shrub model, the GS2. So to me, like if I had to pick, just to generalize, I would probably pick those three. Um, the TL3 came from the changes I made uh, to the yarding um, polygons. Then the bottom one is a report for the whole square. So it's not just for the burn unit, but it's for my whole landscape. And you can see it reflects pretty similar to what I had within the burn unit. So I don't see a lot, you know, proportionately, it's not that different. So when I'm running anything in Behave, I kind of 
now I can know what fuel models to pick. Um, Cause that's always, that's the, I, you know, when, because it's not spatial and behave, it's kind of hard to, you know, to know what you, if you're just picking one or you're picking several and is it, if you pick one, that's really not the majority, then you're getting outputs that probably aren't reflecting the actual fire behavior. So having that breakdown in my mind is very helpful. So this is how behave plus works with the contain module. And I am, I'll be honest, I'm not a super expert in this, but um, so I ran this, I ran this last night just to see some different outputs. So on the right is the input. These are the inputs that you have to put into behave. Um, so again, you have to pick your fuel model. So in this case, I pick those three um, and you can only in behave, you can only vary one, uh, ver you know, one thing. So I could pick three different fuel models, but I couldn't pick any, I couldn't do any other, you know, multiples with the rest. So in this case, we're just looking at three different fuel models here. Then I, I put the same inputs for the fuel moistures that I had in IFTDIS, 7, 8, and 9, the 100 and 120. Uh, I put in a 10, this is mid flame wind. Um, IFTDIS uses 20 foot wind. So always make sure you know the difference in which wind speed you're using. So in this case, I just put a 10 mile an hour wind in. I, I grabbed a 20% slope, just sort of a, just to, to use something that seemed reasonable. And then for contain, what it wants to know is, you know, you're basically running this to see, can I contain a two acre spot fire in this case? So I put two acres in here. That was just me get, making a guess at a, at a size. And then you have to put in these other inputs for the suppression part. You have to pick a, a you know, a, whether you're doing a, like a head, head fire attack on it or, you know, attacking from the rear. So you got to pick that. The offset is, are you, are you going direct, like right on the edge of the fire, or are you, you know, some some offset of that, which would allow, of course, allow the fire to grow. In this case, I just put zero, so we're right on the edge of the fire. And then you have to pick these line production rates, and this is the part that drives me nuts about this. <laughs> and not, I'm not just talking about behave, but I'm just talking in general. It's really hard to, to estimate, um, you know, a resource and how how quickly they can build line, right? There's so many variables, but we have these tables to work from. So if you clicked on the arrow and behave, um, this is, you get, I'm gonna go to the next slide here and then I'll come back. Um, you get these production tables, right? So you can, and you can just use these tables for, for anything. And I'm gonna show you how I thought about it with 50 dis but so this one at the top, this one on the left is an engine, is a engine crew and you decide how many people and then, of course, this is the 13 fuel models. They don't have the 40 in here. So I just made some general assumptions and went with like this closed timber litter type stuff because that's kind of generally what we had on our landscape. Um, and it's about 20 chains an hour of production for a four person engine crew. You could also just sort of take an average. So if you looked at the rest of these fuel models, you could just make an average um, of that for a four person. The one on the right is a 20 person crew. And in this case, I picked a type one crew. And again, their average production rate in closed timber litterish is 10 and a half chains an hour. So just keep that, just keep them, that's where these numbers come from is these production tables and, and you have to pick them in, even in behave. So in this case, I wanted to just say, okay, if I had an engine crew, maybe that was my contingency resource. Um, and I'm in these three fuel model types. And then the arrival time is saying that they arrive an hour after the fire is, the, the slop over is reported. And how many hours are they gonna work? So that's this two hours here. So it's two hours of building line with a four person engine crew, essentially. And this is what you get from behave. So for each of these fuel models, it's basically telling you, could you contain a two acre spot fire with that resource? So you could see under the grass shrub and the timber understory five, um, it's telling you no, basically you would not be able to contain that with a four person engine module. But with the other timber understory fuel model, you could. Um, so it says contained um, time from report, sorry, this got cut off. Um, how many, in this case, it was almost three acres, they were able to build line to contain a three acre fire. And then how many chains do they actually um, 
would they have to construct? So, so th that's so obviously fire burns a little slower in the timber understory one than the TU five and the GS two, which is why they were able to contain uh, fire in that fuel model, but not the other two. So that's how contain works in Behave Plus. Um, you could add other resources to it, and but you're just you know you're just getting these numbers, which are you know they can be helpful, and you can game this out, and you can make your fire size it report larger, um, and add more resources, and then see if you can contain it. So that that's basically all we have to work with when it comes to figuring out numbers of resources. So I'm gonna scoot ahead. So so I ran this again in Behave, and this time instead I just I just picked that the GS2 model, which I knew we couldn't cap we couldn't catch with just an engine crew. So now I wanted to see, well, if I use an engine crew and a type one crew, can I catch it? So I put both of those in here. This is under the, the resource uh, production rates. So the engine crew is 20 chains an hour. The type one crew is 10 and a half chains an hour. So again, you have to get those from the production tables and stick them in here. And then you then you hit go. And again, this is just for that grass shrub model. And you can see with those two resources now, I still can't catch my two acre fire uh, within two hours. So again, that's kind of how how behave contain works. So it can be useful. There's definitely there's things about it I think can be useful. But what I want to show you in IFTDIS is maybe we need to use these sort of things in conjunction with each other because the spatial imagery in IFTDIS, I think, adds a lot of, um, I don't, just gives you a lot more to, to hang your hat on rather than just simple numbers from Behave Plus. So these are the steps that I've come up with in my own mind. And this, again, this is where I'd love to have feedback from folks about the way to think about this. So for me, I think about it as first running that basic fire behavior in IFTDIS. And the idea is to look at those, those outputs to say, where am I going? could I have problems? Where do I have high flame lengths or fast rates of spread? Maybe it's an access issue. You know, is there a road system or maybe there's not? Uh, maybe it's a very steep terrain. So you can look at that in IFTDIS. So identifying those areas around your burn unit where you might have problems. That's the first step. Then we have some other uh, tools in IFTDIS, some of these other data layers I'm going to show you. We've got potential control locations and the suppression difficulty index loaded into IFTDIS that you can look at that I think are very helpful in this. And then we also have the, um, the minimum travel time model in IFTDIS where you can sort of game out, um, game out spot fire size. So in, in Behave, we could just get the numbers. In IFTDIS, we can actually look at the spot fire growth on the map. And then we could still use those production rate tables to kind of do a wag on resources. So that's those are the steps. I, so I'm going to walk you through these steps. I'm going to before I do that, though, I want to I want to ask if there's anything in the. Uh, in the um, chat that we need to talk about. Anything Bree or. Josh, Nicole, um, I think we have been able to answer sure. most everyone's questions. Can you guys hear me? OK, yeah, yeah, we got you. Yep. Um, and I think possibly what Kevin's last comment, I think Kim is going to cover some of this still in her presentation. So I, I did respond to that. OK, great. Yeah, and like I said, I think I think as we move forward with some of these ideas, we, we'd love to have folks' opinions and input on if we could build something in IFTDIS, what, what would it be? You know, what would it look like? What would be the best, what would be the most useful thing um, in order for y'all to have something streamlined that would give you what you need for your burn plans? So as I walk through this, keep that in mind. You got a hand up, Kim. Uh, Travis, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Was that Do you want to answer a question? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, I'm having a hard time with the, the chat here. I can't see anything or post anything. I was just going to say you should be able to um, use two fields with multiple variables and behave. You mentioned using one. I've never tried it with contain, so I you, guess that's the one. Yeah, yeah you can. Um, 
it, gave, it kept giving me an error actually in the contain module. So I'm not sure why okay. Okay. I didn't have time to go in and dig into it. So, but you're right. You can vary more than one variable in there. I just was having trouble making it work in contain. So I don't know if it, it could have been operator error for sure. Um, but yeah. in the fire behavior I mean, I part, I know you can. Yeah, I can yeah. see where you could put multiple sizes in there along with that and then give you some information. If, if you find a spot fire that's two acres, you can contain it. But if it's four acres, you call a wildfire right away or something like that. So. Right, right. Yeah, no, that it, you're right. So I may have been picking the wrong things to vary and behave in the contained piece. So, so yes, oh, thank you. For sort of along those lines, Kim. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are not from the USDA and you don't have your USDA PIV giving you access to the chat, we are working on that. But in the meantime, if you have a question, I can make sure that, you know, the folks involved with IFTI just get your question. Uh, just send me an email, jennifer.croft at usda.gov, and uh, we'll get your voice in the room. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, Jen. And yeah, feel free to raise your hand too. We can you can just unmute your mic and ask. That that was great, Travis. Thank you. And I'll just add in to kind of reinforce what Kim said. We are talking about how to. Kim's going to show you with what we already have in IFDIS, maybe how it can be leveraged to get at what you need for some of the requirements that are coming up involving containment. So. You know, this is what we have. She's going to walk through like how you can use it that way. But we were talking a lot about what we can automate in the system um, to to make this easier and to get you guys what you need. So we definitely want, um, you know, folks are interested in working with us on this to be, you know, some sort of a, a field advisor. You know, I'll put a plug in for that too. Maybe not right now, but when we get closer to maybe doing something this way, um, getting folks input would be great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're building this for for use in the field for you all. <laughs> so definitely that input's super helpful. OK, so let me walk through these steps here in Nifty Disk. So the first step I said was to run that landscape fire behavior. And this is the same output I showed you earlier. Um, and the idea here is to identify those critical holding areas um, whether it be rates of, in this case, I still have rate of spread up. But what I did on the map here is in IFTDIS, you can, there's a measure tool where you can measure distances and, or acreage. So from our burn unit, I basically wanted to say, well, how, how far away is stuff? So in this case, the green, green dashed line that, you know, is the forest boundary. Um, so I, that was kind of important in this case. And you can see the burn unit is actually fairly close to it. It's 0.6 miles on the east side and 0.87 miles on the west side um, till to, to we hit the boundary. And granted, we, we heard about what happened in Oregon, um, it, you know, in Malheur County last couple of weeks, and certainly the fire getting off of the forest boundary and onto private land or other, um, you know, ownership is important. So th that's why I wanted to kind of point that out. Um, that you know, using these distances in this measuring tool in Nifty Disk can be can be useful. Then the other thing I put in here was just sort of distances to other values. So there's a structure um, on in this burn unit area to the north. It's in the red circle, and it's about 0.88 miles from the burn unit boundary to the north. So if you're burning with a south wind, that would be important. Um, and then we've got, there are some communities and stuff, uh, both east and west of the burn unit. So about five miles to the east and about three miles to the west, there's some structures, there's some farmhouses, there's some other little, little communities there. So I, I just wanted to point that out so you could see the scale of where things are at. And again, this was, I ran this under just our regular moderate prescribed fire parameters. So our same inputs that I used earlier. So again, you can see the rates of spread. So from this, I might look at this and go, okay, I'm starting to see some yellow and orange faster rates of spread over here on the left, where it's you know, kind of in this, where it says three miles. And then over on the right, where I'm close to my burn unit, or sorry, my uh, forest boundary. Again, we get some faster rates of spread in here. Um, and then even up to that structure to the north, you know, it's because of the fuel models, right? We've got sort of faster spreading fuel models in there. We've got shrub and maybe some grass shrub. Um, 
and some just grass. So anyway, again, it's going to matter when it comes to containment, holding and contingency. So that's the first thing I do is just get sort of situational awareness on where everything is related to basic fire behavior. So this is not any sort of extreme event or anything. It's just just our regular old prescription parameters. OK, so we go to the next slide now. This is the potential control locations layer. So this comes out of the RMA dashboard. Um, you know, these were run for pretty much the whole um, the whole country um, and are available for your area. And so I just we we have these in FDS. You're just a layer you can see on the left. You can just you can add them and turn them on. And again, and then this is the metadata. If you're not familiar with this layer, this is what it is. You know, it's a statistical uh, layer that was developed to look at um, where fires can be controlled based on terrain and road access, um, fuels, um, topography. All of those things are put into a to a model, and then there's like this this output that sort of indexes everything. So you can see the the burn unit boundary here in the middle, and then you know the green is obviously easier. Uh, you know, a better potential control location than the red and the orange. So for me, if I'm a burn boss and I'm looking at this burn plan, I'm like, OK, and maybe I've never, you know, maybe I'm not familiar with this area even just by looking at this, I can immediately get a pretty good view of where if I do get an escape, you know, where is going to be my best bet for catching this, meaning the fire. So for, let's look at the east side here. So if the fire were to escape off this east side, you know, now I can look at these potential control locations and say, wow, OK, even if the fire spread for this whole thing, I might let's go back and now look at these roads. If these are, in fact, roads or trails and, and say what, you know, is that going to be a good place? And what would I need for resources? Is it engines? Is it dozers? Can I even use a dozer? You know, I need to check on that um, hand crews. You know, what is going to be the best resource? To, uh, to if I did get an escape, whether it's to the north, to the east, to the west, whatever it might be. So I think this layer is really beneficial when you're thinking about holding a contingency. And we can turn this on and off um, in IFTDIS and look at those values. The second one is the suppression difficulty index layer, which you know is kind of uh, kind of sim you know similar with a little different twist. Um, again, still looking at um, at fuels and topography, et cetera, but it also takes into account those production tables that we looked at in be, that are associated with Behave Plus and that we can use independently. Um, so it's, this is basically a rating of how hard is it to do suppression on the landscape. Um, so you can see it's it just, just like we looked at the last one. Here, you know, here's all this red stuff over here on the West. You know, it's hard to put a fire out there and it's, Again, fuels, access, topography, et cetera, where it's a little bit easier over here on the east most because of access and change in fuel type, et cetera. So you'd want to go back and look at your fuel models and try to toggle these on and off. But I think as a tool in a burn plan, I mean, this is pretty informative when it comes to contingency and holding. So then the third part of this is looking at that minimum travel time and simulating like a spot fire. So in 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 behave, you know, we can run that and then we can get an acreage. You know, we have a two acre spot fire. In Nifty Disk, we can actually run something under our prescribed uh, our prescribed fire prescription and see what it looks like if it were to spread outside our unit. And that's what the minimum travel time uh, model does. So just like the basic landscape fire behavior, similar inputs. There's a little more to it with the mo the MTT model. So in this case, we have our landscape on the left and the orange circles are where I was saying, well, what if we got spot fires in those particular locations? Not maybe not at the, all at the same time, but any one of these at any given time. Um, what would it what would happen? So in 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 nifty disk, you can outline your wind speed and you have to do a wind speed and direction. So again, I this time I put in a 20 mile an hour wind speed. And remember, these are 20 foot wind speeds, so they would be reduced at eye level. And wind direction here, I decided to pick southwest, um, which is 230 degrees, you know, give or take. So southwest wind, same uh, fuel moistures that we've been using. Again, I'm going to skip over the fuel moisture conditioning. Um, right now. 
and then uh, I need to tell it where to do the ignition, which is where those orange circles are. So it's, that's just done through a shape file. So I just drew three or four little little tiny polygons and saved that as a shape. And then that became my spot fire ignition points. And I am using my I see in the uh, that there's maybe a question about the landscape. I am using my edited landscape. So this is the one that I went in initially back in the first part of the presentation and did all the corrections in. That's why you can see the yarding blue. The yarding is the the yarding mechanical treatment in here. Um, so and then the last part of this is you have to tell it um, well, you can put some barriers in. So maybe you had a really definitive barrier. Maybe there's a really good road or a wet area or something. You could outline that as a barrier to fire spread. Um, in this case, what I did is I, I actually made the burn unit itself a barrier because I didn't want the fire to burn back into the middle of the burn unit. I just want it to burn outside of the burn unit. Um, so I did that. And then I picked a burn period length. And in this case, I used four hours. Um, and I just did it for one burn period. So sort of kind of simulating an escape, right? Say we had these spot fires and it we couldn't quite get around it right off the bat and they started to burn for several hours. And you can pick whatever time frame you want. I picked four. It made the spot fire grow enough that I could see it and I wanted to have something I could show you all. So, so that's what I, but you could play around with that burn period length, um, whatever's reasonable for, you know, for your situation. So those are the inputs for the MTT. And then I'm going to run this and show you what it looks like. But of course, I have to put a plug in again for our help center because this is a little more involved model. And if you've not run this one before, I really highly recommend you do some reading before you do it. Or if you have an LTAN or an FBAN or somebody on your unit that's really good at this stuff, I would visit with them just a little bit just to make sure you're 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 kind of getting you're understanding the inputs and outputs, but there's a lot of great information in our help system again, um, and that can, there's a tutorial in here too that can walk you through it, um, and there's some warnings in here as well. These you'll see these red boxes um, that might point out something important about the model. So just just go through the help system if you're not familiar with running this type of model. So what we get when we run our four little spot fires, again, so just go over the inputs again. We had a 20 foot wind at 20 miles an hour. We had, the wind was out of the Southwest and these were our fuel moistures, 789, 100 and 120. And we let it run for four hours. So based on those fuel models that we looked at, remember we had the grass shrub, we had some timber understory in there. Um, some just grass models, you know, you could go back and look at the land fire data to see what model uh, fuel models were out there. This is what we ended up with. So you can see, so I'll start here on the left, this one on sort of the heel of the, of the burn unit, because remember we had a southwest wind. Um, we did get some growth on this one, um, 23 acres. And the mileage here, I, I went ahead and measured, I used the measure tool in IFTDIS, to I, I wanted to know how much perimeter there was so like how much meaning how much line would we have to build if we had to put line all the way around one of these so that's that's what the miles are for and i'll, I'll show you in a minute i'm going to convert it so we can use it for uh for production rates so this one to the north uh about 50 acres so a little bit bigger uh due to wind direction and fuel type i'm sure and then these others um this is you can see this is the measure tool in nifty this so you just do measurement. You could do acres. In this case, I got 35 acres around that spot. And then you could also use the other, uh, the ruler here is the, in order to measure the perimeter. And it's about 0.75 mile, quarter, three quarters of a mile of line, of hand line or, or fire line. And then this other one is just a tiny bit bigger, about the same size, 36 acres. So that's if I ran this for four hours, what would happen? Of course, not doing any suppression on it, just letting it go like it was a spot fire and we couldn't catch it. So from that, then the next step is to I threw them into Google Earth because I, I wanted to look at terrain. So you can download these from IFTDIS and just put them into Google Earth and just sort of look and see what the terrain looks like. So that's what I did here. So you kind of get an idea of uh, of of why you know why did it do what it did and and again it's going to follow the fuel types for sure and that's what happened so you can get a, get a look at that 
And then I zoomed out a little bit more just to get a better look at again those communities off to the off to the west and then this other one off to the east, you know, thinking worst case scenario, you know, where where are our big values? Um, and again, I remember our forest boundary is out here as well. Another way to think about doing this is you could ignite your whole burn unit. Like say the whole thing escaped all at once, which of course we know will isn't going to happen, but it helps identify where the problem areas were occur under different wind, wind and weather conditions. So you could this again, this is the exact same run I did. I just showed the whole burn unit igniting all at once under a southwest wind. So now I could say, OK, it looks like, you know, the, obviously this northeast corner is going to be a, a, an issue. If I had a south wind, you know, we could see what our problem areas would be with a south wind. And you could just choose your wind direction based on you. You might have different options for your for your prescription and you want to see under different uh, prescription variables what the problem areas might look like. So you could just rerun this several different times under different wind patterns or wind directions and then or wind speeds for that matter um, and see. And then we have a compare tool in Nifty where you can look at them next to each other. I can show you that as well. And then again, just use the measure tool. So we got about a half mile um, of growth under four hours in this scenario to our, again, it, we're approaching our forest boundary here. So to me, this is quite informative when it comes to contingency and holding plans. Um, now I can at least put some timestamps on things and I can spatially see what values could be impacted. So again, that again, looking at that. So the last one I just showed you was the distance. That was a half mile. And then size wise, using the acreage measurement tool, that's about a 240 acre area over four hours. Again, that's a steady 20 mile an hour wind under, you know, under these conditions. So, you know, maybe that's realistic, maybe it's not, but at least it gives you a way to, to sort of gut check it against what you might see on the ground. So then we could go back to our little our little production tables, um, which again are using the 13 fuel models and sort of work through the same little math problem that we did in behave. Um, we know what production rates are for an engine crew and a hand crew. We know our acreage and we know how much line we would have to build by using IFTDIS. So whether we could just do a little math, you know, I just averaged a lot of things here. There's probably lots of ways to do this. Again, this was this was sort of my wag to think about, well, how can we take those production tables and actually come up with some resources? So I just did like an average spot fire size and I came up with about 35 acres and that was using those four different spot fires about three quarters of a mile of fire line. And so if you do the math, remember there's 66 feet um, in a chain. So that's 60 chains. And then we go to our production tables and we know our engine crew can produce 20 chains an hour, the type one crew 15 chains an hour. And we do our math and we could say they could contain that if uh, a four person engine crew in three hours. Uh, type one crew would take them a little longer, and if you put them together, they could do it a, a bit faster. Again, that and that comes down to fuel type and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's a pretty crude way to do it. But again, those production tables are still really all we have um, when it comes to resources, whether we're using Behave or using IFTDIS. You know, it doesn't matter. It's still really the only measure of production that we have for resources. Of course, if you went and picked a dozer and you're allowed to use a dozer in this area, then Maybe that helps you decide what resources I should have on standby or in my contingency plan. So I haven't I haven't thought this through probably as thoroughly as I need to, but again, this is where we're at with IFTDIS, trying to think about if we built this into the application, what would we want it to do? Would we want to run a spot fire and then have a drop down list and pick maybe resources that we had available to us? Um, I don't know. I mean, that that's kind of where we're at with kind of decide what where we go with all this. But you can do a lot with it as it exists right now. And I think by looking at these things spatially, um, looking at your train, your fuels, et cetera, you can get a ton of information to make your contingency and your holding plan a lot more thorough than by just using our standard methods of, of just looking at behave and not looking at it spatially. 
Um, so anyway, that's kind of what I had really. So my conclusions really here, and then we can have some discussion. Um, you know, I think it's a pretty powerful tool that lets you look at those landscapes and fuel models, critical holding areas, values, but verifying your landscape and making your edits to make sure it represents your, your reality is, is step one. You gotta do that and, and get that part uh, right. Um, then we have all these other reference layers available to us um, that we probably haven't used for prescribed fire very much in the past that I think are quite quite useful. Then we've got our modeling in IFTDIS, both the basic landscape fire behavior and the minimum travel time model. And then certainly taking this and putting into like a Google Earth viewer, viewer at least for me, I'm a very visual person. It really helps me understand uh, better what's what's happening and what I might need to consider as a burn boss or someone writing a plan or maybe someone assigned as the holding boss or you know whatever the case whatever your role might be so that's kind of where I'm at with ifty this but I'm I'm definitely open for discussion and, uh, and and I'm done with presenting so what should we do now <laughs>